I'm going to make this distinction, not just reserve land, all land. Oh yeah, no, no, no. I've all had... land, all, all, all the land, all of it. Um, just go to my website, just copy of the, uh, uh, which back on. I don't know if it's still breaking up. Ooh, yeah. Uh, I had to bring up the technology gods in the beginning, and I angered them. So <laughs> now we have to give homage. <laughs> I always think of it as the fact that I grew up so off grid and backwoods that me and technology just don't blend. I'm grounded. I'm too earthy. And the <laughs> funny thing is, is I'm really not earthy at all. I'm very much a water sign, which means mm. there's no stability in earth. In oh. me, but, so maybe I just. <laughs> I take electricity and I shock it. I guess that's what it is. So um, you're electrocuting. I'm electrocuting. <laughs> so I'm just gonna ask because I don't know how to start this. Mm -hmm. Um, I uh, I would like to start in ceremony with you if possible, but I don't know how to approach that. Um, I'm learning about ceremony and I understand and accept that that is an indigenous based practice in um on turtle island and i don't know how to go forward um coming into ceremony with others in spaces like this so, so i'm asking for your feed your guidance so like i don't think i i uh, none of my ceremony would be turtle island indigenous anyways because i okay. am so uh, intersectional that um, I can't, uh, there's maybe two things on my altar that I can tell you come from my Turtle Island indigeneity, right? Mm. Like I have an abalone shell on my altar and um, I have, she's on TikTok. She's one of the most badass warriors I know. Uh, Casca made this for me and gave Beautiful. this to me um, when we were, uh, uh, when we were protesting together downtown in 2020. And um this is 100%, it, it's, it's like, oh, many communities believe that being a warrior is more about, you know, uh, defense of community out of love, right? So um, this is kind of that warrior aspect, that defense of community out of love, and that's something that I can post. Um, but everything else <laughs> on my altar wouldn't be uh, Turtle Island Indigenous. I have Celtic stuff on there. My ceremony, um, for me is um, about the way that I live. So for me, um, mine is really intersectional. If you look at my <laughs> altar, there's shit from everywhere. I have a mortar and pestle that I got the, uh, the mortar with, it. I got that, it's, it's marble. I got it when I was in Iraq. Um, oh. And then, uh, and a mortar and a pestle, I mean, that's pretty cross-cultural. That's one of those things that is really everywhere. Everybody grinds something. And then um, I've got an iron cauldron and a bell that's glass, it's painted, and a couple of triscals, uh, lots of stones that my daughter Is has that how you pronounce it? A triscal? That's how I that's pronounce the, it. That doesn't necessarily tri mean that's... <laughs> Some people say triscal, but to me, it's a uh, triscal kind of... How many things out there do you... I mean, like, that just doesn't make sense to me. Like, in my brain, triscal uh yes it's try but how many things that are try do we say try try yeah and it's true so distinctly and then it it's skull <laughs> i don't know where yeah in my head i've always pronounced it triscale but who the that where the fuck did that, that come yeah and that's and the triscale is like uh it's it's you'll see it as a l-i-a and Dean, oh okay okay so it is something that is so that is a very cross-cultural symbol as well so this is called a tri chasak, tri chasak in Gaelic uh, and Irish, and it means um, three-legged. Right, because you can <laughs> okay. see it in the Nords and you can see or in the Scandinavians and you can see it in the uh, Celts and you can see it all the way down into Spain. Um, you can see some um, uh, some thoughts of it and other things. Three is a, uh, a power number in so many different spaces. Right. Um, so it's just very, so for me, like, I don't, the most I do for like ceremony 
is um, I'll light a candle and I'll talk to my ancestors. And I don't do this very often. I, and I don't do it in times of need. Um, I do it in times of gratitude. I mean, like I use it as a time of gratitude. And um, like the other day when I was driving down the road uh, after dropping my son, spending an hour with my son, my oldest son who has since he was seven, not let me hug and kiss him. He's, you know, he's not mama's boy, he's daddy's boy, you know, and, and spending like two hours because I was driving him back and forth to work. There were two really positive hours and I'm driving away and, you know, I'm having positive interactions with all my kids. My life is really good. And I'm like, thank you so much. And I just was driving down the road, just talking. Thank you so much for this. And I'm so blessed and so happy for this. Um, that's really, and, and then if I'm cooking or if I'm, um, um, doing something uh, to cleanse, I might do something a little bit more ceremonial, like, and cooking, I don't really do ceremony. It's just like, I think whatever I'm cooking. And I, you know, I know that so much that I eat these days is not a healthy thing to eat. Like the, the animal behind it didn't live a healthy life. And for me, I, I, that's a hard thing because I grew up with hunting and I grew up with honoring animals. And to this day, my dad, the only times I've ever seen my dad cry is if he made a bad kill. That's, oh yeah. Right. You know, that's the only times and not that my, I always believed that men could cry because my dad cried when I was young over a bad kill, actually. Like I've always known men could cry. It's just that men's grief was about different, th- you know, not different things, but men's grief was, you know, a different grief. And so, or at least his maybe, um, cause I don't think I see distinguishing between male and female, but not so much to me, but for me, uh, when I talk to my food, it's just as I'm cooking it, you know, I'm so sorry for the life that you had. Thank you for giving me this. And may you find some peace in the next space, you know? Um, yeah, that's beautiful. And then cleansing houses. I think for starting a, um, a, uh, like a talking space, right. Cause that's what you're yeah. doing is t- starting a talking space. Um, I would, f- for you to initiate it, Find some things that, you know, are with your nations and with your, um, your uh, history and the ancestries that you're studying and that you're being a part of, right? And that you're like really trying to connect to. Find some things that are important there and then, you know, say, hey, I would like to, you know, do some form of a ceremony and do some form of a, a asking for this space to be a space of peace and, and, and love, you know, and, and And I'm totally willing to do something like that. Uh, But I do want to say that it's going to be very cross-cultural. So it wouldn't be represented. No, no, that's great. Whatever you have, you know, Um, whatever it is that you, you have and, and feel guided to do. Um, I've been, I've been thinking about this as I've been doing these, um, these talks and I'm always too afraid to bring it up because it is a little bit out of my, um, my comfort zone in communication right. in the West. And I think it's really, really important. I've been taught that it's very, very important. So um, I would like you to lead today if you'd like, but I'm definitely going to consider, um, I was given, I was given the suggestion to find for myself a prayer that resonates with me or a song or like something that I can say in these moments to create that for myself and my guests so can I play something for you really quick yeah please whatever uh computer play rising Appalachia harmonize huh Appalachia can you hear that okay it's just background right now I'm going to send you a link as well okay This is just some music, right? This is a song that it's a song for lovers, but it is also a song done by uh, Rising Appalachia is a sister pair that was in uh, uh, Standing Rock. And um, okay. this song is about meeting together and speaking together in a, you know, uh, a space of joy and a space of uh of harmonizing right nice yeah conversation of harmonizing it might be something that you could like you know maybe play in the background as you're getting started or you know bring some of it into it if there's a it might be a song that really resonates with that that's the youtube 
right there of it so that you can watch it if you want. And they are, they have a lot of beautiful music. I actually, their music is prayer for me. Like I'll, I'll walk through the nice. street singing their music, having it full blast on my earphones because I can't handle being out in public. And so like, or, you know, like when the worst moments of my life are going on, they like make it to where I can function because it's beautiful. all about being, res there's a song called resilient actually. And it's all about being resilient. It's all about, you know, uplifting in the message so you'll like that that might be something that works for that for you great thank you thank you i'll definitely check that out i'll definitely check that out um okay did you um did you yeah. want to do anything um, honestly whatever you feel guided i'm i don't want to pressure you kind of drop this on you like no you're fine you know. i i i um i just i mean for me it's always so simple i would just say that I want to ask that my ancestors guide my words in a way that um, they can be heard and that my message be loving and um, intersectional and uh, about community and, and light and light as in energy, community and energy and that interaction and that um, tending of the biome, right? Thank you. And, um, and that I'm very grateful always for these opportunities to be able to have a conversation with somebody, to be able to say the things that are on my mind because somebody's asking me questions about them and to be able to articulate them better. And I'm very grateful for those out there who are constantly and consistently um, working towards uh, community, a broader sense of love of community and I think that things like interviewing people and um, trying to spread these messages more from as many different perspectives as possible is a very powerful way to do that. This is the second time I've done one of these. I felt that the last time was extremely beautiful and powerful as well. And um, I think that uh, that desire to uplift and bring knowledge to everybody on a level that isn't out there is really powerful to me and I'm very grateful for that. And may my voice, uh, may my voice just bring as much healing as it can and as much understanding as it can. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. What I've got started for my song or prayer, whatever this is that I'm doing is um, miigwech, merci, tapadlat, Go Romila Machigat. Just basically just thank you, thank you, thank you, a million thank yous in um Ojibwe, French, uh Gaelic and Irish. Are you using this in part as a uh connection journey as well? Is that what the yeah like the, the intersectional kind of conversations are for you as a reconnection and a my well this is where um where i reached out to you is because you were instrumental in leading me towards educational sources to help me along my celtic reconnecting journey which has been life-changing yeah and uh necessary <laughs> and um so that's been happening it was the peter beresford the yeah. druids yeah oh Wow, that was yeah. beautiful. And I've gone on from there and I'm still learning. Obviously, I'll be learning the rest of my life um, about this, but it's also brought me to being um, a reconnecting Celt on Turtle Island. Like that's really integral for my own path that my rooting has to take place on Turtle Island. And because of my deep resonance and connection with land through through culture, through reconnecting, um, I'm I'm coming to the doorway of reaching out to indigenous um, knowledge keepers and people who are open to teach non-indigenous about being here on Turtle Island and what that means in form and in spirit. So that's why bringing together the languages and because like the language is so essential for indigenous people, but also my own uh speaking of Gaelic and Irish is is it's magic it's a literal it's like a like a rekindling or a re-sparking of of that 
culture here yeah. and so I <laughs> the the Kaliach are on Turtle Island that is something that keeps repeating in my in my head and, and I'm that that's a beautiful thought process yeah. right there yeah that really is and, and it, oh and I need to do it in Boos's video there was a video done by an Irish man um, from Ireland right now and he's like hey if you're Irish American and you're standing by what's happening you know, and supporting, you know, Israel and Joe Biden and everything else. And, and, he, and he goes over what the, you know, starvation was, what the great starvation was, you know, um, yeah. and, and how, because that is how so many Irish Americans make it to America, right? Mm -hmm. And he's like, as you know, for those who are not like those who's allowing this, well, he says, as for Joe Biden, who's allowing this, you know, he's like, you're not welcome home. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, Listen, fair enough. Your right? family left because somebody imposed a great starvation and you're supporting a great starvation. You're not welcome to come home. And, yeah. and, and I think that that there's just this power in this understanding that um, we don't have the same traumas. We have similar traumas in some spaces, right? You know, we colonization has been enacted in much the same way across the entirety of the globe because mm -hmm. of the fact that colonization starts in one space and spreads out. The idea of it starts in one space and spreads out, really. But colonization, it, it and, and, and the reason that we have similar is that the Samis, the racism that is inflicted upon the Sami and the, the genocide that's inflicted upon the Sami was led by people who were talking to and interacting with the racism committed by the uh, people in the United States and the genocide committed in the by the people in the United States against the indigenous people here, interacting and going, well, this is how my racism is. Well, this is how great my racism is. You know, this is what a head I am. This is how much I've misunderstood the thought process of love, you know, and so there's similarities because they're all interacting and going, well, this is how I'm doing it. Um, so understanding that racism and, you know, the structure of othering that has been kind of cross global and kind of brought out in this need to suppress and this need to keep down is committed everywhere in this genocidal action of trying to just stomp out entire groups and what's happening you know in palestine it's definitely that at this point right yeah 100 um, uh, seeing the if you can go back far enough, you can see within the Celts how the colonization there happened and how the genocide there happened, right? And you don't even have to go that back that far sometimes. Um, if you can take the understanding of the um, earth connection, animistic connection, biome connection that the Celts have prior mm -hmm. to colonization, right um and prior to christianization um and translate those roots into a new land you can and i've often had people actually state this i've heard elders state this before you can indigenize yourself to space right because many of the epigenetics that you're going through are the same epigenetics or similar epigenetics right trauma doesn't affect anybody the same and not all the traumas are the same right but similar epigenetics and similar understandings right so i think that that's for me it went the other way i was uh because i was raised with an indigenous culture and my first memories are like elders speaking um and my first understandings of how the world worked was an animistic understanding of it from a turtle island indigenous perspective it wasn't until i was 12 that I shifted communities, shifted indigenous communities from the one that I was not biologically born into, but literally born into um, and a part of into a new uh, indigenous community that I was told for the first time that mm -hmm. I wasn't indigenous because up until that point, I was indigenous. That was the only thing I knew I myself was. And when they started calling me a Cherokee princess 
and telling me I was a pretendian at 12, my first inclination was I can't cause harm. I knew what a pretendian was. So, you know, I can't cause harm. I can't do harm. And I'd always looked for all of my ancestry because that's how I've been raised. So I dove into the Celtic ancestry and I dove into the Celtic ancestry from that indigenous thought process, like knowing what the Turtle Island indigenous thought process was because I had grown up in it. When I looked at the Celts and their pre-colonized colonized life, right? It mm -hmm. was a look at it through the eyes of being indigenous. So I could only, honestly, I really only saw the indigeneity. Like it, it, it doesn't mean, I, I've been very careful, especially later in my life to um, make sure that I'm distinguishing what is Turtle Island indigenous um, versus what is Celtic indigenous. So I'm not crossing those, you know, and making everything pan indigenous. Um, but uh, looking at it first through indigenous eyes, it's like I, I remember reading about, you know, well, I remember watching The Craft, you know, I'm a child of the 80s. And 90s, right? <laughs> so am I. I remember that too. And I'm hating it every step, <laughs> hating it every step, because it's, all I could see yeah. was that's not right. Mm -hmm. Like, that's not how we interact. Like, there's nothing Celt about that. Like, yeah. You know? um, yeah. And, um, and, like people having like the witch's Bible and, and, and that for me is just over the top weird. I've actually had people who were Satanists and heard that I was, I, I used to say Wiccan. Um, and um, so, and I would say I'm kind of Wiccan, but really I'm kind of before that, like it's deeper for me. It's always, and I've always had to clarify, yeah, I'm Wiccan, but it's, it's more connected than ceremonial. It's more like mm -hmm. dug in than, than I call the four corners, you know? <laughs> I, that's exactly how I feel about that calling the four corners thing. I, it's, yeah, there's an experience lived connection with land that happens through this. Like, yeah. Well, and for me, and I think that it's an important and integral um, distinction that I would want people to know and understand is we look at it as a land connection, but it's not just the earth beneath us. It's the entirety of the biome. And that's why I've started trying to make sure that I include the word biome within most of it, um, because the trees and the animals and, you know, the bugs and the birds and the everything, if I was going to plug anything, that would actually be what I plug. Um, so I wrote a book. And that's why I was like, I can plug the website, but I wrote a children's book that goes over this. Oh, we are we. Yeah, nice. And what it is, is it talks about being the connection to the biome. The last couple pages, um, my space in the biome realized in the care I provide, knowing each spark of energy, nutrient, song that goes missing is felt to the depth of me. For I am us and us is me and we are we, right? Beautiful. It's about not just the, and it talks about growing your roots down into the soil beneath you, you know, like from yeah. the base of your spine, it, it goes into, it's basically grounding and centering for smalls. And, <laughs> nice. Uh, so um, that integral, integral, integral connection with the entirety of it, we have to, um, get back to I think for me is mm -hmm. where we really because so many people don't see don't see it as existing on its own level of existence right yeah yeah value uh value in its own um beingness as opposed to how it can benefit or profit humankind um I I absolutely agree. For me personally, I think that the the one of the biggest problems is the cutoff. Like when 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 Celts immigrated to Turtle Island, there was enormous cutoff and it didn't just start here, but by god, it really got finished off here. They thought, "Woo, we can come here and we can be Canadian or white or whatever identity they put on and we don't have to deal with all of that stuff that happened and because you know it fucking wasn't yeah <laughs> it wasn't ever dealt with like the the Irish and I mean the Republic of Irish have probably done the best work at at 
at least keeping alive the the understanding of what happened or maybe not I don't know there's this song by Sinead O'Connor called famine which was my first introduction to like the oppression of my ancestors and paying people to not speak your language and paying people to disconnect from culture and when you disconnect from that memory um then you're you're traumatized but you don't know why yeah do you know what I mean so yeah anyway I went on a big tangent there but no you're fine you're fine I I didn't tangent to me it was just a question (laughs) um I would um Yeah, my brain farted. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> anyway, it started with the cutoff. And oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I think that's I think that's huge. I think that when we look at um we can really see that that cutoff really happens for a couple of different people, right? Like so you can see um one thing that those in Turtle Island um who were indigenous in here before 1492 are, are indigenous and were here before 1492 have uh, is the fact that while many are displaced from where they're at, they're still in their land. Same thing with the Sami, where many are displaced from where they're at, they're still in their land. Um, the Ainu, they're still in their land, right? Uh, the Irish are actually still in their land, those that are in Irish. Same thing with those that are in Wales and those who are in Cymru and those who are in Scotland. Um, and then, uh, uh, you have groups that were literally picked up and transported like those who uh, are black within the United States and Canada or the Western hemisphere, black within the Western hemisphere. And uh, those who uh, like the transportees like the Irish uh, who or the, and sometimes English who were brought here against their will like the Jamestown prisoners Mm -hmm. and stuff like that, the exiles. and you know then you even have this sense of cut off and those who are brought over here or not brought over here but come over here of free will trying to escape different things or just for a sense of better even when you look at like the second sons who would come over here to try and get huge swaths of land because they didn't have it in england you get people who are cutting off their history you know they're Mm -hmm. they're leaving their history behind and they're leaving it behind in a hope for something new and better right and so in that hope for new and better for many people there is that um or for anyone who came over here in a willingness there is that hope for new and better that gives them the ability um for those who were transported but not stolen um that was able to exist as a little bit as well um for those who are stolen of course there is no hope for anything at that point um all of those cuts all of those severings of ancestral ties you know um are as much about like the ancestors of your close-knit right here as they are about the roots of the land and the the interaction with the entirety and um that understanding that comes from living in a space for thousands of years right that that knowledge of what this world and this biome is um i think that we can all find new connection with new lands i wouldn't speak to other people's ancestors i would only speak to mine we have to understand that connection to the land as um i don't want to say invasive species uh, because the, well, we are an invasive species as a whole, those who are seeking to reconnect are not that invasive species, right? They're those who are spe- seeking to uh, figure this out in a new rooting system, right? Um, but as outside species that need to grow in and around with the understanding of um, not becoming invasive, that's probably I'm not sure if that came across in a way that's quite understandable because my brain sometimes, but, um, I, you know, (laughs) well, Um, carrying along, carrying along the, the weed, um, analogy, like invasive species comes in and disregards everything that was there and takes it over and crushes it into oblivion, like rooting with respect and care and compassion would, would make yourself a benefit to the ecosystem and not a yeah not an oppressive 
thing. That's just the visual I was getting as your perfect. That's the visual I was it. hoping for because that's exactly <laughs> yeah. what it was. Um, and, and that's and I think that that I mean for me that's it. It's 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 when I talk about land back. And when I talk about returning governing intendants, a big part of that. Wait, is, what does that mean? I've never heard that before. Governing intendants? Tending, like, sorry. Tending. So tend, tendants as intending the land. Oh, so okay. Me, okay. Land back is about returning the governance of the, the land itself. Like what happens in these borders, for lack of a better term, um, is governed by the people who are indigenous to these lands. Um, yeah. And then tending, um, meaning like tending and har honorable harvest tending. For me, okay. I believe that our species is here to tend. That is because every species is created to fulfill a niche within the biome. And as every species is created to fulfill a niche in the biome, our niche in the biome is the niche of tending. Hello to those of you in audio um, on the podcast audio only, I've included an etymology of attend on the video uh, because I care about words and where they come from and what they mean. So tend is actually a shortened version of attend. That's where we get tending from is to attend to. Um, and an, ab an obsolete version is to be subject to, um, which I love because we belong to the land. And that is in our role as, as to tend to the land, is we belong to the land and we are subject to the land. It also means to take care of, um, to put our attention and focus towards. It is from the root word to, towards, and um, stretch. So it means turning our attention, energy, and efforts towards and stretching to um, meet with the land and I love that our mm -hmm. niche in the biome that's why we're the only species that adapts is adaptations other species have adaptations spot fox has a den beaver has you know his his dam you see that crow crows crows corvids try to say two words at once um, can make their own tools. There are other species that can make their own tools. We're the only species that takes the tool that we've made and adapts it further, right? Getting us from Homo erectus's first usage of fire to the computer that we're on, right? So um, our niche in the biome to me is the niche of tending. And so if we return tending and governance to indigenous people, that tending of the biome and listening to that tending of the biome um, it's not like somebody who's white gets out, right? Like, or it's not like somebody who's from England has to leave. It's, so this is the way that the land needs tended. And the person goes, oh, shit, we can do that. You know, like that, that makes sense to me. Let me listen. Let me give honor to your knowledge of this space. Let me, you know, and so, um, it is all about learning how to plant your roots within the biome to build up the biome right, mm -hmm. to, to increase the um, health of the biome. And so uh, that's exactly, you know, how, like, that to me is the becoming indigenous to space, right? That to me is how you can take your, your Gaelic ancestors and come over here and, you know, honor the people and honor, you know, the space and honor the, the light and the journey there, right? Um, I think it's important. I think that we should all be seeking that no matter what space we're in, right? We should all be seeking learning from the indigenous people of that space, how to better, better tend the land. 100% and, and sovereign, sovereign leadership, sovereign authority over land, 100%. And not just, I'm going to make this distinction, not just reserve land, all land, Oh yeah, no, no, no. I've all had... land, all, all, all the land, all of it. You didn't I make the distinction for for a, a, somebody who was running for president, and they were running for president on a land back ticket, and I got asked to come in because they weren't listening. I got asked to come in and try and explain, and it was like, you do understand that when people say land back. They don't mean, because you could listen to this person talk and this person would talk about uh, making sure that uh, 
indigenous people had control of their land, making sure of indigenous people had control of their land. And it's like, do you not think they have control of the reservations? Like indigenous people have control pretty much within the reservations. Like sovereignty is, is I mean, not always there and there are problems and issues and everything yeah, else, yeah. absolutely, right? But it, it, that's their land, that's where they have sovereignty, right? Um, what? Like, no, land back means all of it. All of it not, not just you can take care of the one that i give you but oh it's all yours here you go let me step down as president and he, I'm like, yeah. how can, if you do realize running on a ticket that says lamb back that the first thing that you have to do is step down like that's <laughs> that's literally the first thing that you have to do as president you have to yeah. step down but that well I, I just, I want to, I'm not sure that um, indigenous nations have complete control over no, their, and, and their there land. And there are some that make, don't, right. Yeah. There are some that don't. I do know some that, I, I mean, I've talked to people who are like, I don't know if you understand that we have sovereignty over our spaces. So I do know there are some groups or some communities that absolutely do because they are adamant that they absolutely do, right? Um, so... I can't say that they don't because I know that some groups do, but I also know that some groups have very little to none, right? Right, um, yeah. Or if they have any, it is um, a controlled any, right? Right, right. So, so um, well, I do know that there are communities who are very much adamant that they have sovereignty within their space, which is why I had to say it that way because I don't want to discount the fact that there are one, there are communities who are very adamantly having sovereignty. I also know that there are communities who absolutely do not have sovereignty on any level, right? And, but I like, uh, I like that distinction that it's all land. Like, uh, I just think it would be a simple, I think it's simple. Sovereign nations, indigenous and provincial federal partnership. Like that's, well, and I, you know, we have a map that shows us where our nations were prior to colonization. Right. right? There, there are plenty of maps out there that I have seen <laughs> that shows plenty us where every maps. single, you can put in your zip code and find yeah. out what nation had control over the space that, that, that was their, not control. I don't like the use of the word control, had um, reciprocity with their biome. Had, oh, what a great, uh, you know, belonging, yeah. belonging to their space. Presence. It's, yeah. It is not about control and it is not about owning that space. It is about right. belonging to that space. Right. So there you can put in a zip code and find the indigenous nation who belonged to that space before you came to that space. And if we can do that and, and it, it, many are cross buffer zones, yeah. like there are, you know, like they, they overlap. Right. So mm -hmm. those are no man lands, not that they don't have tending and governments governance, but that they don't belong to a specific or that it's not a specific nations belonging. It's an intersectional space. Right. Right. Um, and it was very common and accepted for for nations to share land. It was no one owned it. We share this. Like, of course we do. Indigenous people were constantly at war and they had slaves. They and they killing each other and they no that's your fantasy a b there are so many instances that show of indigenous groups whose idea of war was to go out and hit each other with fucking sticks and get away mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. what counting coup is there's no damage to the other party the mm -hmm. honor is how fast can you get the fuck away and do you get tapped back right Interesting. and 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 it, it is it is i run up i hit you and i get the fuck away and nobody you can't nah i got free clear i got the tag in right and and yes there are absolutely nations out there that have violence yes there are absolutely nations out there that committed horrors absolutely you cannot look at any group and think that any well you can't look at the indigenous nations of turtle island as a singular group anyways Right. right. Very, so many, very pointed, you know, and yeah, even then you can't look at any race or ethnicity and see a group that is the same across all space. Right. So, um, yes, there was violence, but the violence was not like the violence that came right? no. and, and nowhere near that. So you get a lot of that, uh, you know, well, it was just as bad. And it's like, no, 
No, it's not. And I'm currently reading Human Kindness by by Bregman. Um, and it's this whole investigation into are we unique, like innately violent, you know, and it's just our nature and it just comes out and he's finding again and again, the research is showing no, 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 no. It, when you add um, land property, when you add owning land and megalomanias, like the Kings, like you talked about, that's when you get violence. That's, Absolutely. that's where it happens. The archaeological I've been thinking evidence. about you so much while I'm reading this because I'm like, oh, the archaeolo Sarah talks archaeological about evidence shows it starting between uh, 10 and 12,000 years ago, we see a rise in violence. We mm -hmm. have 2%. So we have roughly 2000 uh, finds ancestors that we have from prior to uh, uh, 12,000 years ago, like that we found in the archaeological record, right? I mean, this includes like Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalus, um, and the early Homo sapiens. This is, most people don't realize just how small the archaeological record is between 10,000 years ago and 2 million years ago. Well, no, 5 million, because Lucy is included in this, right? So we have under 2,000 skeletons, um, or roughly 2,000 skeletons prior to 12,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. Um, in that we see 2% of things that can be attributed possibly to violence, right? We see things that um, like one that I've seen is there's a spearhead, uh, in the tip of a spear in somebody's thigh. Now this does not mean, I mean, it's an angle like this pretty much downward. You can't see that. Here's the thigh. It's an angle, top of the thigh, lower leg, angled downward like this. So this could be something that, um, you know, that's not how you hit somebody if you're fighting them right this is way more something it looks like you know or i would think that you know it's in a hunting accident or maybe it's it's a flint napping accident i think it looks like a flint napping accident personally um, i'm but sorry a flint napping accident you can't say these things and just move on like that's common parlance so sorry what napping is a dangerous profession profession Flint napping is so when you break off anything off of obsidian or anything off of flint, it becomes this extremely sharp. Uh, obsidian is actually so sharp that um, it can cut between cells. Like oh. uh, we use obsidian in microsurgeries today because of the fact that obsidian is the only thing on this planet that when it's uh, flaked right, it becomes such a fine blade that it can literally cut between cells. So wow. if you are knocking off shards and they hit you wrong, right? People who flint nap obsidian or flint today end up with cuts up and down their arms. Usually you want to have like a leather thing over your lap to flint nap because you're holding your, your blade on your knee usually, right? You might be, I mean, you might be getting up close. It might be up a little bit more up your thigh or something like that, but you're holding it down on your lap and you're um, uh, hitting a rock against it, or as you're getting smaller and finer, which if something's already pretty blade-like, you're gonna have like a uh, uh, antler tip and use the tip of that antler. And then you use that to go around the edge to get it really fine. Um, so it's, it's a very, uh, you, it's a sharp object skill to have. Like there's always a sharp object that's flying at you in this God, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so it could possibly be from an accident, flip na flint napping. It could possibly be from a hunting accident or it could possibly be because somebody threw a spear at him, right? Mm -hmm. um, we don't know, it's not definitive violence. If somebody uh, has what looks like a rock crush him in the back of the head, it does not tell us whether or not that rock was welded by a human hand or that rock was fallen from the top of a cave or a landslide or something like that. You know, we can't tell. Yes. But at 10 to 12,000 years ago in the archeological record, we see the rise of violence go from 2% possible to 18 to 20% definitive. There's nothing mm -hmm. else that these things could be. One of the first ones is a massacre in Kenya where we see eight people lined up. And uh, one of them is a pregnant woman um, whose hands are bound underneath her belly and all of them are executed from behind. And so we see like our first massacre happening, right? Um, and so we see this very sharp uptick of violence. I do not think that anything in our body uh, says violent. I personally believe 
that, and I know that this is more than a personal belief. I believe that this is actually a scientific thought process fact as well, but to me, species speciate without toxicity. If you are, have something in you that is toxic to your species development, you don't grow. How do you grow and as a species if you are, um, if you are born with a gene that stops fertility, mm. how do you get bigger? If you have a gene innate in your species that, um, you know, every time it gets cold out, y'all fucking die. Every time it gets cold out, <laughs> y'all fucking die, right? If you have a gene in your species that is toxic to your species being able to continue to grow, um, you know, if you have a gene in your species that comes from mutation later on, right? That's absolutely possible. But things that are innate to the species, things that are, you know, the entirety of the species and things okay. that are, you know, a foundational part of that species can't be toxic or species can't grow. Can't okay. Grow. So, so, so the, the psychopathy of leadership is not innate to the species. I don't think so. Well, I don't think so either, but... <laughs> But I'm just like, right, right. Well, no, that makes like sense. Bregman's Bregman's talking about how um, the 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 archaeological record shows that, and I'm not sure. I just took it as face value. Of course, I believe everything he's saying, and I can't remember what his proof was. But that psychopathy and and hubris and the de the desire to to control was was murdered out of of more of ancient ancestors that they would they would get rid of that from their society so we don't have I, I can't see any i mean so that would have to be evidence that we see in the archaeological field of how depending on how ancient we're talking right and i'm gonna to have find... to look up what where he says that because because i just i just went yes of course but maybe that was him just musing and it wasn't and it wasn't this is the guy actual... that you were talking about who was talking about the uh yeah okay so it's, so he yeah. believes that we took care of it by getting rid of it he doesn't believe that it's something that came up later he believes it's something that we had from the beginning but we got rid of it or that we um that it, it we stopped getting rid of it um this was before property when we were his his argument is that it's when we were nomadic before we settled and became um, uh, agriculture driven, um, that that kind of hubris was not tolerated, that there was not the acceptance of a singular charismatic leader that was going to control the group, that yeah. that was that was not. That was not I don't acceptable. Know if it's something that was killed out in the kids. I, you know, like, you know, you see that uprising and you take care of it. Um, so I don't know if I agree with that thought process just because I, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm saying it properly either. Right. Like these are my sense. thoughts that I'm having while I'm listening there's to him. Talk. No way we can tell from the archeological record, what somebody's psychopathies were Fair. and anything prior to the advent of documentation by us. Um, isn't going to give us a knowledge of psychopathy within an individual. We can use documentation mm -hmm. of us to see psychopathy within an individual, right? We could probably see, like, we do know, like, uh, MPD has an aggressor gene associated with it, right? So, or, or some form of a gene associated with it. So we could probably see that in somebody's DNA, but I've never seen any studies where we've took other people's DNA and there's, there's not a single skeleton that I've ever heard of that states, well, this one was a psychopath, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that's fair. That's fair. Um, so, uh, uh, so we can see that in writing, but that would be ancient, right? And yeah, all writing yeah. that we have that we've translated comes from the after of settling, right? Right. So, so that's an interesting thought process, but I'm not sure if that's something I can see in archeology. span I tend to think more, and, and I, I do think that, yes, I, we probably would get rid of those who acted like that. I mean, if you're acting antithesis too, um, and, and it might ex 
explain why Sargon was floated down the river. Maybe he, as an infant, was acting like a shithead. And they were like, okay, this one's a psychopath. <laughs> See you later. Bye, God King, you know. Um, so maybe, maybe, um, but I'm not for certain. I would say that for me, I think that biologically we didn't have it until. So I think that epigenetic trauma caused it. 